space. So they have found bacteria that have adapted so quickly and so dramatically that you cannot um, compare them to any species on Earth, which means they basically became new species. Hello and welcome to the New Space Vision podcast, where we discuss rising technologies, economic opportunities and social dreams centered around new space and innovation. We will talk with executives, founders and other exciting people from the startup and new space ecosystem. I'm Daniel Seidel. And I'm Sven Shivara and we are the founders of Life Your. Today I'm very excited about the podcast and the podcast guest which we're going to talk to, Mark Kugel, co-founder and CEO of Yuri. Um, because the topic which we're going to cover is microgravity research and production in orbit. I think one of the most exciting topics, and if I wouldn't have worked in Earth observation, most probably I would have worked in that field. Um, but, well, let's take directly dive in. Mark, first of all, thanks for being here. Can, us, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your company, Yuri? Yeah, thanks for having me, uh, Sven and Daniel. I'm excited to be part of this. Yeah, I'm Mark. Um, I'm one of the three co-founders of Yuri. I'm the only non-space engineer in the founder team. So Maria and Chris, my co-founders, they worked at Airbus before and yeah, had this amazing idea because they worked in that field. And I kind of uh, stumbled uh, into that amazing group of, of uh, three people now. Um, I myself have a background of uh, an industrial engineer. So it's kind of 50% engineering, 50% uh, business. Uh, I actually worked at Airbus for a couple of years with the excitement for space um, but i left it directly after um, my dual studies i did there because the, out of the frustration of being a big corporation um, i then did my masters at the tu munich i then joined the cdtm there and um, out of the excitement for entrepreneurship the cdtm is a joint institution of the lmu in munich and the tu in munich where very entrepreneurial and ambitious students um, apply and then kind of get through the typical phases of a startup where you first analyze trends, then you build a product within three months, and then you consult a startup. Um, and I talk a lot about this now because this really completely changed the way I think about the world, about um, my own abilities. Um, the students class uh, in 2014, we were 24 students. And out of that class, 11 startups arrived with today market cap of, I think, almost 13 billion wow. um, and more than 3,000 employees in total. Um, so among my fellow students, there were the founders, Hanno, Arseni, and Roman from Personio. There was Thomas from Trade Republic, and there was uh, Felix from Plantura, um, Sebastian from Luminovo, and, and a couple more really amazing startups. And growing up in this kind of environment really kind of showed me, okay, you know, also as a crazy, naive student, you can build great companies. Um, I then I built my own startup in 2015 called Usely, um, so almost similar to Yuri which was a completely different space. Uh, it was consumer electronics, peer-to-peer -peer sharing. We wanted to uh, have that impact of people not having to buy so many things, but just rent it from other people. Um, we were in contact with some of the Airbnb folks um, there to, to mentor us in this and did that for two and a half years. And we then sold the platform to a larger corporate. I then moved to Rolls-Royce, um, helping them setting up their digital unit. Um, on the same time, uh, making a long list of potential startup ideas, uh, which I wanted to found again was there for about two and a half years again. And then, um, luckily, on a founder's event, I met Maria and Chris completely randomly. Um, and apparently, I was on stage pitching, uh, and someone asked me uh, if I want to start a startup again after being in corporate for two years. And I said, yeah, definitely. But um, it probably has to be something cool, maybe something with space. Um, and <laughs> luckily, Maria and Chris were in the audience. And afterwards, I actually pitched to get employees for all choice. And in the end, they kind of pulled me out. And uh, that's... Is kind of where the first minutes of Yuri started. And Marie and Chris had this idea for about a year earlier already. We wanted to do this with Airbus together first. But then um, after a couple of months of negotiation, we just decided let's just quit our jobs and start from scratch, which we never regretted since then. So, Mark, a funny thing is that Sven and I knew Yuri before you did, basically. Exactly. Your co-founders back then, uh, they talked to us and we uh, had an exchange about the new space ecosystem. Back then, they were still at Airbus. Um, and uh, I very often got reminded of you guys in the very early days because I have a sticker on my computer for Kiwi Microgravity. That was the first name uh, of Yuri, basically. And uh, yeah, since then, we have a long relationship. And you also pitched our new space vision meetup in 2020. It was before COVID. Uh, one of the last meetups, and it, 
it was very impressive what you have uh, done um, back then. And I think now you have already, uh, you had already your first mission under your belt. Oh, it was upcoming. Um, so can you tell us a bit what has happened since the meetup in 2020 until today? And what Yuri is doing? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I uh, forgot to talk a bit about that. Um, yeah. So what is Yuri doing? And it's actually doing slightly different things now than we uh, envisioned three years ago. So when we started, we really came from this world where a NASA or a European space agency or other space agencies contract big um, companies like Airbus to develop technology to bring life science research to the International Space Station. And this is kind of what Maria and Chris did for many years at Airbus and did this very well and won NASA prizes and all kinds of things. And they also saw that this process was pretty broken because in the space industry, many of you know, we have this cost plus contract. So space agencies contract you um, and they just tell you, give us your costs. We give you a fixed percentage of profit on top of that, um, which basically means everyone has an incentive to keep costs high. And Maria and Chris back then already found the system broken and they just um, already had first ideas of making things modular, making them reusable, streamlining that process. And this is kind of what we wanted to do as Yuri in the beginning. We wanted to become the most efficient service provider to bring anyone's science to space, right? Um, and we did that um, quite well, I think, for a couple of times. We sent um, neural stem cells for UCLA in California to space. We sent um, an experiment for the big pharma company GSK to space. And we have a number of missions now lining up on the next rocket launches, NG-18, SpaceX-26, SpaceX-27. SpaceX um, so we have quite a, a long backlog of new um, missions we fly up to space. Um, what happened since then is that the first three years, we really improved that process and really up to, made it up to 10 times cheaper to uh, bring those payloads to the International Space Station through making um, hardware more reusable, like SpaceX did with rockets. And we just um, kind of applied the same principles of just having off-the-shelf hardware, reusable hardware, modular hardware, and to the life science infrastructure in space. Um, since then, we um, grew to about 30 people now. And about a year ago, we thought, okay, being that service provider is pretty cool and it's a lot of fun. You know, you get to go to launches, you make those scientists happy. Um, but of course, you probably with just the service business cannot build a huge, uh, ambitious lighthouse company with maybe hundreds or thousands of people, um, but you probably will always remain a 10 to 20 people team of engineers doing kind of contract work. And um, so we thought, okay, what, um, what could actually be the bigger vision to uh, yeah, make this a, a, a giant impactful company that really improves the world in the life sciences? Um, and uh, obviously that was going to science ourselves um, because we always saw that people... Um, They were hesitant, especially big pharma companies, to like really put in the large amount of dollars needed to show amazing data to then use this as a viable, scalable lab in space. So we always said, hey, this is a cool environment. And they told us, okay, yeah, show us more data. And we said, yeah, but you have to first book a mission to show even more data. And that's why we wanted to break that chain and say, okay, let's become a science company ourselves. And that's why about a year ago, we raised our seed round intentionally, mostly with biotech and deep tech investors. Because we thought we already know space very well. It's a small community. We have a good network, but we're very weak yet on the biotech side. And that's why we brought in um, the amazing 50 years from San Francisco as a lead investor who have invested in Varda, for example, but also in um, a couple of very ambitious biotech startups um, and complemented that with Apex from Vienna, with Nucleus Capital from Berlin, um, close to you guys, and with uh, possible um, ventures in Munich and a couple more. Um, and all of them being very good at building complex bio um, companies. And there we also brought in from summit Stefan Oschmann, uh, the ex-CEO of Merck, like obviously good to have a pharma CEO if you want to build a biotech company. Um, so it was kind of this naive thing, well, we as great space engineers, let's build a biotech company. But of course, the, the first step then was to hire a chief scientific officer, someone who really knows how to build a biotech company. And this is where we then had a six months process And working with a headhunter with more than 1,000 uh, candidates to screen. Uh, in the end, finally, through a direct uh, contact in my network, I got a WhatsApp saying, hey, I heard you look for a chief scientist. I think I have the perfect candidate for you. And so after going through six months screening, out of 1,000, we had the two best candidates. In the last two weeks, we almost wanted to sign them. Someone in my network uh, 
jumped in and now we ended up hiring this person and we're super happy that that that, that happened so sometimes it's just coincidence um, especially in hiring and so you cannot plan everything in the startup yeah and, and with that we now become a biotech company happy to talk about this more but in the end it's really using microgravity as a platform to develop our own biotech products that are not possible uh, on earth yeah that, that's already quite a pivot as a company right so first of all, saying I will provide a platform for microgravity research, and now you will go into biotech. Uh, one follow-up question regarding investors here. Um, so I know uh, I also introduced you to some of uh, um, uh, our investors, uh, and they did not invest. They said it's a service company and uh, didn't see the recurring revenue. Um, there was also a big blog post uh, from the former Descartes Labs founder. Um, it, I mean, it was about Earth observation, but he was talking about investors Uh, and how they evaluate the space business. So how many investors asked you about monthly recurring revenue, MRR or ARR, and how did you react to this? Uh, so how did you convince the investors at the end who did invest? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, to be honest, that was kind of a filter of um, how we decided, you know, which would probably be a, a great fit investor and, and who would probably not be the most uh, yeah, valuable for both sides. And so... The typical software as a service or e-commerce investors or just the typical digital business model investors um, were never really the best match, I would say. Um, I think we had great discussions and some of them said, okay, we want to leave our comfort zone and do the first space investment. Um, but we were, in terms of strategy, still so early that we really wanted someone who could help us on this painful journey of becoming a biotech company. Um, and that's why, to answer your question shortly, No one really asked specific these kind of questions, but we got a lot of typical general VC questions, which didn't apply to our model back then. And on the contrary, the ones who asked the right questions, I already saw like in the first sentences that this might be a great fit. Like 50 years, for example, their, their pitch was, you know, we're 50 years and we don't uh, back sushi delivery services or any of those kind of typical uh, not world improving uh, models, but we do really the difficult stuff. We do the stuff that really improves the world. Um, and that was like where we really resonated um, with each other. And also one example of like Alastair from London, from Selvage, and he just asked very specific biotech questions. You know, what about lipid nanoparticles? What about this? Oh, I have this portfolio company where this could be interesting for mRNA or for other topics. So these were the right questions that we wanted to have a year ago in these discussions. And this is also where we, cho where we chose um, the The syndicate, um, luckily, we were three and a half times oversubscribed, so we had the luxury of uh, being able to choose. And in this case, uh, we are still until today extremely happy. And we uh, extended the seed round with, with two more investors, um, one bigger one who um, yeah, also invests a lot in life science and Worth Ventures, who just joined, who also have a very strong uh, backing and uh, network in the pharma industry. And, and this is really the way how we choose our partners, like who can really um, yeah, assist us on this journey and not just infuse the cash and, yeah. and have nice chit chats. And we really want the investors that, you know, give us uh, the hard support and uh, also the hard feedback. Okay, cool. Well, but I assume you're doing fundraising or what, what is your role in the company? Yes. Um, since we are a venture back company uh, a year ago, I'm, I'm doing <laughs> fundraising. And before that, or also still today, um, I do a lot of commercial strategy and sales. And so really we came from this i would say old space world of just space agencies paying us for work and my job until today is to leave that niche and enter the commercial which are much larger markets like pharma biotech and um, the life sciences markets in general very very cool maybe for an outsider like myself or maybe like the people which are listening to this podcast Why is microgravity of interest for biotech research or other types of research? Why is it important? Yeah, most important question. And um, we answered that quite late in this uh, discussion, but uh, <laughs> happy to answer. I think we can separate it uh, in, in two ways how microgravity is useful. One, microgravity as a manufacturing environment. So without gravity, um, biological systems behave differently and you can manufacture things in a more effective way faster, better way. One example is uh, cell cultures and human cell cultures. Today, if you're a pharma company, you want to test a new drug, you today either test it on single cells, human cells, or on animals. Both methods are pretty bad. So single cells of humans don't give you a real good answer whether your drug will be effective or toxic. And an animal, 
It's just you have we have this huge ethical problem, but also it's just not a good model. So a very common approach in recent years has become growing 3D organoids, so three-dimensional cell cultures, and testing drugs on them um, because apparently they give better answers whether a drug will be effective or not. Um, but growing those in Earth on Earth is extremely difficult because gravity restricts the growth. It restricts the complexity, it restricts the size, and it re restricts the speed. So some organoids, we talked to some companies, take more than 100 days to grow. And so this is far from a very efficient commercial manufacturing process. And while many missions on the International Space Station have shown that organoids or cell fashion in general, they proliferate, so they grow faster, and they grow in larger structures, they grow in more complex structures, and can therefore be potentially a better model to do drug screening. And, but also in the future, you know, maybe five to 10 years down the road, we could grow whole organs uh, in space just because we don't need artificial scaffolds to hold those together. So this is one thing, using space as a manufacturing environment. We can also grow better crystals, for example, and there's other companies that are not doing life science but um, are doing material science. They grow, for example, fiber optics cable um, just because it's better crystal. And so there's many very interesting use cases where you can do manufacturing in space just because you leave out gravity. And the second one, um, which we're also heavily looking into, is using space or microgravity as a trigger, as a pure trigger. Um, and one of these triggers is very interesting on organisms. So our CSO, Daniela, has worked on a lot of papers of pathogens and organisms on the ISS. And what they have found is just mind-blowing for me. So basically, they have found aliens in space. So they have found bacteria <laughs> that have adapted so quickly and so dramatically that you cannot um, compare them to any species on Earth, which means they basically became new species. So basically, bacteria have grown to a new kind of species while they were on the ISS and when you bring them down. So more, I think more than 30% of the genome has changed in a very short period of time. So we can use those adaptations that happen within days, which would happen maybe in a few years on Earth, to develop features that we might not get on Earth. Um, so just think you want to trigger bacteria to eat plastic um, just based on a certain environment. And it's hard to engineer that, but if you kind of let it mutate into that direction, we could use space as an accelerator for that. So this is kind of the, the second thing that, and there's many, many more examples on that, using space as a trigger for some biological system to change, to make some changes, often random changes, but many of those changes are very useful, and then we reverse engineer them on Earth. Super that's, exciting. Yeah, that, that's extremely exciting. And you mentioned uh, organs, uh, to grow organs in space, etc. cetera. So, uh, um, I mean, there are so many mass diseases uh, you can you can fix with, with uh, uh, microgravity um, uh, products. And uh, maybe one, one personal thing. Mark, do you remember, uh, I am on a short list at URI, right? Do you remember the one? For the, you no, know, for the organ, right? Because you have a, I remember you mentioned one of your organs. <laughs> no, oh, no not, your knee. It, was it your knee? Yeah, exactly. It was my knee. So, so, so I put myself on the short list. That's what you need to do when there are three crazy people who want to build a space company. Yeah, yeah I, I'm on the short list. If you ever um, fly cartilage into space to grow it for my knee, I'm the I'm the first one, and I, I just repeat it, and now it's public. So uh, I will I will definitely come back to you. But um, I, I mean. It's very interesting. You mentioned all the biomedical applications right now. Uh, and Sven and I also always think of um, uh, space manufacturing. So why, why did you pick biotech? And why didn't you pick the space manufacturing part? Mm, there's a couple of reasons for that. So one is really the impact we, we want to create. So we really want to yeah, have as much positive impact as possible with what we do. Otherwise, we wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. And the impact of having a faster fiber optics cable to give traders in New York just a millisecond or nanosecond faster trades um, for us just wasn't that exciting. But, you know, curing cancer or doing drug screening more effective to get drugs to more people and it's definitely one thing that, that gets us super excited. And the other thing is also we just have the most experience in terms of hardware development for life science. So Maria and Chris just, um, I think, almost all of the missions they've had at Airbus were in the life sciences, so growing cell cultures, cancer cells, immune cells, but also fish, plants, um, and it's just something we had a yeah an edge on the engineering side where we can already we we knew what the scientists wanted, we knew how to build it, um, and then also to be honest, uh, just the end markets they're just I mean in the biotech things are just yeah huge in terms of 
when you create the impact, how large this can be. Um, just because yeah, the end markets in organoids, in tissue engineering, in, in protein crystallization, um, all are just gigantic markets, um, which we found very attractive. attractive. Yeah. Um, so what's interesting to see is you've already mentioned uh, mentioned the company Vada, and I would maybe touch later on, um, on on where the differences between you and them are. But generally, you can say that that's right now a lot of activity in that space, right? Why do you think that's there? We why do you think we see so much activity in that space? And does things such as the ISS and Barcelona um, also play a, a role in the long term thinking uh, of you as a company or the wider ecosystem? Um, although we most probably will see the ISS being discontinued over the next couple of years. Sure. Um, yeah. Again, I think it's always a mix of reasons. One is that the space, the commercial space industry has matured quite a bit. You know, it's always if a new market exists, then what are the bottlenecks you have to solve to get to the next level? I think the first bottleneck always was launch. Now that being yeah, very well solved already to SpaceX, Rocket Lab, and all the new amazing launches like ESA Aerospace that are coming up. Um, then kind of, you know, a lot of Earth observations, sending satellites into space, it became a lot cheaper. And that's why Life EO uh, became so big and so successful. Um, and now I think the, the industry is just moving to from use case to use case. and I guess the use case we're building was not the first use case people would think of because it's just so complex and so expensive. That's why things started with kind of the more you know basic infrastructure um, segments of the market. And now we're kind of moving towards, um, I would say, more exotic use cases like space manufacturing. Um, and that, of course, comes with uh, decreasing launch costs with just general more awareness of the space industry. And, but also of 20 years of ISS research with more than 3,000 experiments, having all the data and very, very insanely interesting data where we're not at the beginning of, okay, this might be something interesting, but we are, actually have hard data on that it is valuable to do stuff in space. So it was for me just a matter of time that a lot of companies are picking that up and um, developing the killer apps, I would say, on top of that. And in terms of ISS and Bartolomeo, definitely helps, of course. I mean, uh, I think the ISS was just the first test bed to show on the fundamental research side, that things are possible. Bartomeo is just an extension of that and making it easier. Um, but now I think it's the time to find the golden nuggets uh, in all these data we, we, we generated and build great companies out of it. Uh, and whether that is like Space Watch in the UK, I think they look at semiconductors, whether that's biotech products that we do and uh, many more companies that are building that. Nice. Yeah, so um, that, that's that's interesting. You, you touched on the topic of, of data. And I mean, uh, when people think of astronauts, I don't know if they think of uh, these experiments they do on the ISS. They, they think it's fun to fly there. Um, but I mean, the majority of the time of an astronaut is doing these experiments. And now we have decades of history here. Um, why didn't the big uh, pharmaceutical companies took this data and, uh, and went into it? If it's so uh, groundbreaking uh, and innovative. Well, it's the same answer as for everything innovative. Um, it never comes from the big corporates. Right? The big corporates jump on it only once you have really proven it that you can build a huge use case out of that. I mean, why was uh, mRNA vaccines not invented by the, the Mercs and Aros of this world, but of basically two startups or three startups, yeah, CureVac, BioNTech, um, Moderna, they were all companies that are you know, yeah. around 10, maybe 15 years old. Um, and I think it's the same here. Um, and we see that with discussions with pharma, right? They say, okay, yeah, I, I can see the potential. I can, I can see this becoming really big, um, but I have no way to convince my manager to actually invest uh, into that. And so yeah. pharma, especially pharma, has become a lot more conservative in recent years. Um, and they outsource a lot of this innovative, explorative stuff, not, not only in space, but also in Earth. They outsource that a lot to startups and CROs in the beginning. Yeah. So you want to own uh, the value chain, how I understand it. Like, so you want to develop your own drugs uh, or will you cooperate with these uh, um, companies? No, we probably will never develop our own drug like end to end because this is just a, mm -hmm. a $2 billion endeavor. And what we will do, um, depending on a product and some products, maybe like the organoids, we could imagine really becoming a full stack product company where we own the whole value chain. Like we don't build the rockets, we don't build space stations. But everything above that we would build, like the biotech incubator, the bioreactor, growing it, then the GMP uh, facilities, and then actually selling the organoids. This is something 
which is you know difficult, but something I think we could do as a startup. While on the drug development space, we probably just would help in maybe identifying the most potential targets and then writing IP and then selling that license to pharma, or maybe going one step further and doing preclinical research that would most likely never go into clinic just because you know it's so expensive and there's other people doing that better. Okay, so you said other people are doing that better, and you've also mentioned okay, you could see yourself in um, really owning the entire value chain and working more as a manufacturing company, and on the other side, working more as a as a IP owner. Um, we touched on Vada, and you touched on some other uh, companies in some of the other podcasts, Space Tango. I think uh, Tech Shots is another company from Kentucky. Um, how would you say is the competitive landscape in the area where you're in? Well, first of all, there's a couple of uh, great companies that have been around for 20, 30 years, like Tech Shot, which are actually now acquired by Redwire, um, or Bioserve, which we partner with. They're all companies that came, as said, from the old space world, where 99% of the revenue is just NASA budgets and allocated to various organizations, but in the end, it's just space agency business. There's a couple of companies, and we're all on a, on a friendly partnership basis, I would say. So often we contract them, they subcontract us in some cases. So it's kind of a fruitful ecosystem, but of course, it's, it's not really growing. It's just the, the normal space madness, I would say. And then there's a new generation of companies, and Space Tango is kind of in between. They, they started like we did. In, in the old world, but they're also, um, you know, having their first um, feed into the new markets. And then there's completely new companies like Varda. Varda is interesting because um, unlike other companies, they cover two parts of the value chain. So they both build the, the re-entry capsule, but also build the use case on top. Um, and they, at least that's what they told us and they told they tell the public. So we are also in, in the in a partnership with them, we visited their LA office yeah, last year, and they told us um, that they kind of see it like the App Store. They wanted to have that re-entry space manufacturing capability, and they want others to build the great use cases. But like in the App Store, the first two or three use cases, they want to build themselves to show the world that there's actually value in doing that, um, which I think is a pretty smart approach. But also, as far as I understood, they also want to remain just this contract manufacturer. Um, and then there's other companies like Inversion Space, like the exploration company in Europe, um, that just built that that capsule, that spacecraft level. Um, and then there's companies like uh, Spaceforge, similar to Varda, that, that again are doing both, so building the capsule and the use case. In our case, we decided to not build the expensive stuff that can explode, uh, to describe it that way. So we <laughs> never will build any launchers. There's great companies doing that, and I think there will be fierce competition in that side. We also decided not building spacecraft because, again, we see all these amazing companies popping up and we don't need yet another re-entry company. Um, I think we just partner with the best, the most reliable, the most affordable um, capsule providers and we can. And we really focus on everything that comes from there. So it's really our science taxi, which we call it, which is a um, life science incubator facility, which would probably be the first life science incubator in the world that will not go to the ISS, but it will launch on a free-flying capsule um, around the world. And so it will be either a SpaceX Dragon or a Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser. We just signed our maiden launch for 2024 on the ISS conference uh, two weeks ago in Washington, um, where we announced that um, our science taxi will actually launch in Q1 2024. Super cool. Which is just insane to think about. And just uh, when we were three years ago, having a crazy idea, and now we actually built one of the world's first yeah, infrastructures for biotech and space beyond the ISS. That's really exciting. It's really yeah, cool. super, super cool. Uh, so um, I'm always surprised how complex uh, this space ecosystem is, right? I mean, from top level Earth observation, telecommunication, and now microgravity. But if you just go into microgravity, so many dependencies on so many different uh, companies. Um, it's just it's just incredible. And this shows me uh, because in all of these aspects, you have very innovative new startups. Right. And um, it, it's just it's just a very beginning. Uh, honestly, it's 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 really, really mind blowing. Um, but let's talk about uh, uh, your customers a bit. Right. Because very often in in chats online also, you see people complaining about the International Space Station wasted money. Uh, but now you want to build um, a life saving uh, um, uh, yeah, medical uh, um, uh, tools, right? So uh, who are your customers right now? And who will be your customer, let's say 2030? Will that change? Yeah, I think there's roughly three segments. So one is, I, I mentioned this a couple of times already, the 
the old space world, the space agencies. And right now they're still, in terms of revenue, our biggest customers, um, which is mainly the European Space Agency and the German Space Agency and the Luxembourg Space Agency, actually. Um, a bit of, um, yeah, on the NASA side, and but as a non-US company, we cannot directly bid, but just through subcontract. And, but we just a few weeks ago um, created our US entity. So um, watch out for uh, the new exciting US stuff that's coming. And the second segment, um, and, and just to mention, the first one is is great. I mean, for a startup, it's you know seven figure contracts in most cases. It's it's you know a nice volume, but of course, this won't be the billion dollar use case. Then the second segment is kind of research institutes like um, Charité in Berlin, where you're sitting, um, but also now starting with Whitman Stanford or UCLA or UCSD, and, and, and yeah, many of the the world's top research institutes just yeah hiring us to do the space business or also buying our devices to simulate microgravity. So we also have two options to simulate microgravity in your lab on Earth. One is a clinostat and one is a random positioning machine. Um, both of them have uh, pros and cons, but um, they already have great results where we don't have to go to space yet. Um, and they are basically 100% sold or almost 100% sold to those research institutes as well. Um, and the third segment, and this is of course the one um, asking about that 20 for 30 question, is the whole, I would say, biotech slash pharma industries and where we had some first customers, but mostly in the next five to 10 years, it will be collaborations, I would say, and co-developments and then building great products together with them. Because as I said, um, there's so many things that other people can do better. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel in how to do clinical research. So yeah. we'll always probably collaborate with some of the smaller, bigger guys and in the end have an end product and that end product then let's say a new drug or an organoid that will of course then be sold to a pharma company or to a contract research organization or to a biotech company. Yeah. Yeah. We have uh, heard uh, that Merck uh, already today invests 15 million per year uh, on ISS research. Uh, I mean, take the number with a grain of salt, but that's just, uh, just an order of magnitude we heard, um, which is uh, already today exciting, right? But I think as soon as you have shown and proven this unique value proposition there, um, and you can bring it down with reasonable costs, uh, I mean, it's going to explode, right? So, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Especially because, you know, pharma and biotech today is so expensive on earth already. So um, the people don't think we're crazy when we when we tell them, oh, this would cost half a million. It's like, well, yeah. uh, a run on my machine for three months also cost 800K, so I'm not surprised. Um, and that's why also maybe a fourth reason why biotech is interesting. People are used to high prices and because in biotech also everything is expensive. And that's why marrying the both uh, worlds is in our view a good idea yeah absolutely um so maybe maybe before we talk a little bit about the the ecosystem um but what is your what is your big vision for 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 um yuri in let's say five years what's the the five years what's the 10 years vision of yuri uh, in five years we want to have a couple of very exciting biotech products on the market that are you know sold regularly to customers so it won't be a typical mrr or arr business uh, but it will definitely be a recurring product sales business and also aip licensing business so just having a couple of the one uh, the products we actually started working on already today having them on the market and being very successful um, and then in 10 years just insanely scaling that right so and we could think about large uh, factories in space for some use cases and talking about bioreactors we just need huge industrial facilities and in larger quantities and so how cool would that be to really have a, a large industrial facility in space to produce i don't know um yeah large quantities of organoids enzymes proteins uh, crystals whatever and there's so many use cases yeah yeah um, i think that would be really cool um, yeah straight from science fiction <laughs> definitely <laughs> and it's also interesting uh, you're already today a uh, super international company right so you mentioned you just uh, i don't know if you um, uh, announced the u.s subsidiary just in this podcast i don't know but you also are operating in luxembourg right you are uh, having a subsidiary in barcelona and i mean you are in munich right or close to munich in the south of germany yeah exactly um how, how, how did that come um yes yeah, sometimes it's just follow the ecosystem or maybe also the the funding and, and the openness for crazy startup ideas i mean we started in southern germany just because this is where the airbus site is and romeo and chris and also myself have been working we get great space talent there and it's just where we love living so there's not a super big reason like very strategically about this then luxembourg is just because luxembourg is um in a very 
ambitious way going into new space. So as a small country, they always choose one industry to focus on. It was mining at some point, then it was finance. And now the third big industry, the whole country is actually focusing on a space. Um, and that's why everyone, or not the whole country, but like really the whole economical ecosystem is centered now around space. They have accelerators, they have incubators, they have space, literally, and they have large um, support programs to incentivize customers um, or companies like us uh, to go there and to move there. Um, and that's why we um, are super happy to be there. We um, started with basically two people and now it's 12 already there and um, with a, a bigger plan to grow more. We even relocated just um, recently um, a project manager from Boston uh, in, in the US with his whole family with three kids to Luxembourg. And so we also get international talent um, to, to Europe and to Luxembourg. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I think this is exactly the initiative uh, or exactly the, the things Luxembourg wants to see as a country, right? So uh, it's great that, to see that, that the policy is really taking action and, and ta showing its effect. Well, um, and we've had a podcast with uh, one of the drivers be behind the Luxembourg space ecosystem, Gary Martin. Uh, a couple of years back, that was also pretty exciting. Well, a provocative question from someone who is running an earth observation company or two people running an earth observation company uh, because today earth observation and communication are the commercial drivers in low earth orbit and the space ecosystem you could say uh, will the microgravity industry be the same size or even bigger what do you think and when do you think will this happen well what answer do you expect <laughs> obviously yes <laughs> um, i mean just think about really manufacturing it just think about um one product that you know, it's, it's used in so many different use cases and, and we can improve that by 10%, maybe by 10x. Um, and we have to manufacture it in space. Just imagine the insane scale and that would mean. And so definitely, yes, I think it's not a, a, a straight line to say, okay, these are the five use cases and they'll definitely happen. But I think in the sea of opportunities, there will be use cases that arrive that will just become so big um, it's hard to imagine today. And the cool thing I just... I think I heard it in a, in a Varda interview a couple of weeks ago, um, is that we are actually bigger drivers for rocket launches than you guys are. Because once <laughs> you have the satellite up, it runs there for five years. You know, you don't, you don't need a rocket anymore. And, but if you have manufacturing in space, you need to have constant flow of rocket launches because you need to bring it up, let it manufacture there, bring it down. Um, and to create a value, you need to have that transport back and down all the time. And that's why um, if we scale... We're actually a, a bigger cost decrease factor for rocket launches than than uh, you guys with your industries are. Um, yeah, I think I listened to so the same. See. I listened to the same podcast. Uh, you you might be right, but I think it will take some time, and uh, until then, we Earth observation is is still number one. Yeah. Definitely. So let's let's uh, um, I, I, challenge accepted. Yeah. Let's at the end talk a bit about the the costs. Uh, just uh, one, uh, two questions uh, formulated in one. So uh, first of all, what is the cost driver? Is it launch operations or actually deorbiting? Um, and secondly, if a student now wants to have an idea um, launched with you, is there any support mechanism you have? Yes. Yeah, so first question. I'm definitely launch today. I'm still biggest driver. Um, and. To be honest, the launches we have today are highly subsidized by the space agencies, so and the real costs are actually still higher, but um, it's great to watch that they decrease every year. Operations, this is our job, and to make that as automated and as, as efficient as possible. So we're working hard to get that down to um, very low levels. And yes, re-entry is also still a cost factor, obviously. Uh, you need the capsule, and that burns up, so you have some, um, yeah, some damage there that needs to be repaired. But also here, I'm optimistic because there's so many companies solving that now. For the second question, and um, yes, we work a lot with students. And we have a big project called Überflieger with the German Space Agency right now, where we have four students team, so three German and one Luxembourg student teams that um, enter the competition with their ideas. And the four best teams now have the chance to work with us and the German Space Agency and the Luxembourg Space Agency. And we're actually quite far ahead already. So the competition started last year and we launched in on SpaceX 27, most likely in Q1 next year. And um, this is, of course, you know, the, the biggest dream as a student that, that you can imagine, you know, working on an ISS experiment that actually launches. But of course, you need to be very lucky that um, this call is actually exactly when you're studying and that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but still, we also had other researchers that somehow um, yeah, had ways to fund it themselves. So we had one researcher from Australia that just through some grants and university budgets managed to finance his own um, university 
payload and to the ISS with us. So there's still ways. Um, we still are around about 100K of having a simple experiment, 10 centimeter cube, um, end to end, including rocket launch, including return and everything. And our service, um, this is roughly the number um, we can work with, about 100K um, in, in the simplest form, I would say. Um, and then, of course, if it gets more complex, um, it gets more expensive. Um, but that's maybe a target number if you're a student. You can even share that cube, you know, maybe um, you have yeah. two other research groups and just have that. But that's roughly um, the, the number. So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Mark. We are already at the end of the podcast. Um, and um, I mean, the past years we had frequent contact. I'm, I'm super curious what will happen in the next uh, years. And uh, I mean, we have a frequent exchange with you guys, right, about uh, uh, the challenges as a founder um, and uh, the space ecosystem in general. And I'm super happy that we now could share uh, this, uh, this conversation with the audience. Uh, so thanks. Thanks a lot. And it was really, really exciting. I'm looking forward to the next beer garden session with you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mark. Also from my end, we wish you luck for Hamster One. As we've heard, your soon to be launched uh, ISS experiment. I hope Hamster uh, survives and thrives. Um, so thanks a lot, Mark. Everyone, uh, if you like this podcast, please make sure to follow us at New Space Vision on all platforms, including TikTok. Um, and thanks again, Mark, and all the best to Yuri and the entire team. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, Beer Garden sounds great. Lift off. We have a liftoff.